The last few lectures in this class have really been defined by two things, and, and they're kind of polar opposites in uh, their orientation. On the one hand, we've been talking about this juggernaut of an economy, uh, this economy that, that, that really is defined by middle class affluence, a growing middle class. On the other hand, we've been talking about civil rights or a lack thereof and mobilization of the civil rights movement to bring first-class citizenship rights to all Americans, irregardless of race. Today, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the, the combination of the two, civil rights and uh, this, this, this economy, this post-war economy. Now, whereas you saw the booming of the American suburbs and the growth of the middle class, um, there's this other America that uh, we need to talk about. As a matter of fact, the term "other America" was a was a uh, idea coined by a historian Michael Harrington um, in the post-war period, and what it talked about was poverty in America, deeply impacted poverty, a sense of hopelessness almost uh, for the what what Harrington described as the other America. Uh, this was the America that was not immigrating to the suburbs. This was the America that did not come along for that economic joy ride that we were talking about in the uh, in the 1950s. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, this other America is not really going to be something that uh, will be a big priority of middle class mainstream America. It's really it, only the civil rights movement in the rural South that uh, is capturing the attention of Americans of a middle class variety. And that is just beginning to, to get started, if you know what I mean. Um, more than anything else, what I need you to associate with this other America would be the urban industrial centers that had really defined uh, the economy, especially in the late 19th century, uh, really through the 1930s. And so that's where we're going to go with this particular lecture. Um, at the same time that you saw people uh, trying to escape the inner city Detroits and Oaklands and Chicago's of the country, for the, uh, uh, the, the booming suburbs, um, there, there's an inflow of immigrants from abroad into these cities. Um, I want to talk a little bit about these immigrants uh, uh, before we go any further because they're going to come just like these immigrants at the turn of the 20th century. They will come from new and diverse origins. In 1952, Congress passes something called the McCarran-Walter Act. And although this does open up uh, immigration in, in, in ways it will reverse that uh, old archaic 1924 Immigration Act, it'll open up immigration from diverse origins, Southern Asia, Eastern Asia. Um, it, it's got a little asterisk that's next to it as well. What the McCarran-Walter Act did was it banned uh, people coming from communist countries. And so people from Eastern Europe, people from uh, places like China that had gone over to communism by 1952, uh, it's putting restrictions on people coming from that part of the world. So at the same time that it's diversifying these uh, sources of immigration, it's, it's also shutting the door at the same time. Another group that I want you to be mindful of would be uh, immigrants coming from Mexico. Uh, one of the things that the 1924 uh, Immigration Act did was it omitted Mexico as a source of immigration uh, in the aftermath of that law being passed. Probably more importantly, uh, what, what, what World War II did was it created this intensive need for not just labor, but uh, agricultural labor. And the combination of all the men being overseas fighting the wars and all the able bodies uh, that, that were stateside going into factory work where they were making more money, uh, there, there is this crisis, this labor shortage crisis in the agrarian part of the country. And so what Congress is going to do is it's going to implement what comes to be known as the Bracero Program. For your notes, guys, this is a guest worker program. And uh, what you're going to see are thousands of people that will cross the border and they will come to the United States as guest workers. Some of them ultimately, over the course of time, will apply for and receive U.S. citizenship. Some of them, although they don't go back to their country of origin, 
um, some of them remain in the United States for years, dozens of years even, in the aftermath of them coming, long, long time after World War II ends. Okay, So you see an influx of Mexican immigrants during this post-war period. Another group of the Central American variety that I want you to be mindful of would be Puerto Rican immigrants. Uh, you should know by now that uh, ever since the war with Spain, uh, Puerto Rico was essentially a U.S. protectorate, which meant that you didn't have to apply for a visa, you didn't need any kind of special permission to come to the United States if you were of the Puerto Rican variety. What's happening in Puerto Rico uh, it's probably best described as the, uh, as, as the mechanization of the main industry, which happened to be sugar. Predominantly agricultural society, and sugar was the main export, and once you begin to see machines replacing human beings, uh, you begin to see their labor market shrink, right? Uh, opportunity begins to shrink. At the same time, the price of airfare uh, between San Juan and New York City begins to fall precipitously. Uh, you can see where this is headed. You, you do see a, uh, an influx of immigrants from Puerto Rico, and they're coming predominantly to New York, and they're going to bring more social, cultural, and uh, racial diversity to, uh, to, to New York City. Okay? Um, Puerto Ricans are actually going to be the, the first immigrant group that will have the luxury of arriving on American shores via airfare, uh, as opposed to uh, steamboats and a ship. The last group of uh, uh, Central American immigrants that I want you to be mindful of would be Cuban immigrants. And in so many ways, the Cubans really are the exception as opposed to the general rule when it comes to the Central American experience involving immigration. What's happening in Cuba in the late 1950s is a communist takeover uh, led by Fidel Castro. And the people that are going to really do their best to get out of Cuba, those are going to be people of the middle class variety. Those are people that not only are coming with um, some money, they, they, they're, they're not the people that are coming from Mexico, people that are coming from Puerto Rico, that are coming generally from an impoverished background, or at least an agrarian background. These are people that are coming with a little bit of money, but more importantly, a skill set, a skill, a trade, what have you, uh, that's going to allow them to acculturate themselves and uh, adjust to life in the United States much, much easier. This skill set is going to help them be absorbed into the bigger, broader 20th century American economy as opposed to the Mexican experience or the Puerto Rican experience. Okay? You also begin to see a lot of southern immigrants, migrants really, coming up from the rural south into the urban north onto the west coast, centers of what used to be production. Um, only this time it's not simply African Americans. You, you do continue to see Southern blacks moving to the urban north, to the west coast, but increasingly you're seeing Southern whites as well. There's a very specific reason. Same thing that's happening in Puerto Rico, mechanization coming to the main industrial export. Um, mechanization is coming to the cotton industry as well. And what you're beginning to see are these cotton harvesters that are pushing human beings, human workers, off of their jobs that they have really held for generations. It's upsetting this economic uh, uh, norm in the South. And many of these Southern migrants are looking for jobs elsewhere, predominantly in the urban North and the West Coast. Where they're headed would be the urban centers, just like our good friend Jurgis Rudkus. Um, those were where the jobs tended to be, or at least historically, that's where the jobs were sort of tend to be concentrated. Urban centers. So these urban centers suffer from the same problems that they had for, for really since our class began. Uh, a lack of housing, dilapidated housing, social, civil resources that are strained at best. Only now, we're talking about a shifting, uh, transitioning economy, okay? This 20th century economy might be best defined by a term known as automation. For your notes, what automation is is a process whereby machines and robots are going to replace human workers on the assembly lines. Um, if you think back to when industrialization was really taking shape in the United States, 
um, th there were there were Ford Motor Company uh, uh, factories where you'd have 80,000, 90,000 workers that would work in one single factory. There were cities. They, 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 they were not really factories as much as they were in they, they were municipalities or at least the numerical equivalent to municipalities. And so well, at the same time that you see more and more of these people coming into the cities, uh, uh, many of whom, you might even say most of whom, are, are coming as unskilled workers with no real skill set that will set them apart from anybody else. It's a changing economy where we don't need the same level of just sheer worn bodies like Jurgis Rudkiss that we did once upon a time. Now what we need are more of technical workers, people with the skill set that they can observe the manufacturing process and that's obviously going to create a, pro a, a problem, an unemployment problem, or at the very least, an underemployed problem. Now, you have to understand something else. It's not just middle class uh, Americans that are leaving the cities for the suburbs. You're also beginning to see companies. Um, Ford's a good example. Um, in the aftermath of, um, of the war, uh, much of Ford's uh, uh, industrial empire in Detroit was crumbling, needed to be replaced, or at least modernized, and it just simply became cheaper to build in the suburbs as opposed to the cities, or rebuild in the cities. And so at the same time that you begin to see these, these middle class uh, uh, Americans leave the cities for the greener pastures of the suburbs, you also see centers of production leave as well. And what they're taking with them is their tax revenue property taxes, income taxes, what have you, that's leaving the city of Detroit, the city of Oakland, the city of Newark, New Jersey. And so these same problems, uh, 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 you know, dealing with poverty, dealing with job training or the need for job training, they're still there, but now it's complicated by this fact that you've got less and less money coming in in the form of your tax base. Big, sprawling school districts, large police forces that are being asked to get by with less and less money. What this issue is, is typically called by historians would be an urban crisis. Um, it, it's a crisis in that you, you've got the same old problems that defined uh, city living, urban, uh, urban areas uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century, but now it's complicated by the fact that this poverty is becoming more and more impacted. There are fewer and fewer ways to pull oneself out of, the, uh, out of poverty, primarily because you've got a combination of a, uh, of, of, of a changing economy, uh, an economy where you're going to need a skill set to, 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 to be absorbed by it. And you've got the issue of race. You've got uh, these suburbs, and, and as we've had this conversation before, in many cases, these are homogeneous, very exclusive communities where not everybody is welcome. And so it's a situation where you've got impacted poverty, and these people have very few routes of escape when it comes to uh, leaving it. Now, speaking of... Um, um, being, being trapped in the cities. There was a process to deal with some of these issues and, and a lot of it involved what came to be known as urban renewal. City planners understood what needed to happen and that was bringing people back downtown. Um, what they wanted to do was to build these sky-rise uh, uh, luxury living accommodations, uh, fancy hotels, shopping centers, sports, and other forms of entertainment venues to bring people back downtown and, and to get them spending money again. The problem with that is those, those things had to go somewhere, and to put them somewhere, you had to clear some of these things that were typically thought of as slums eyesores, dilapidated buildings, what have you, raise them to the ground and build these luxury accommodations in their stead. The only problem with that is that's pouring fuel on the fire. You already have this housing shortage. Uh, people don't have enough access to housing as it is. And knocking down these uh, you know, eyesores, uh, that's going to complicate the problem because now you've got fewer and fewer options of the low income variety when it comes to satisfying this housing market. So this is really what I mean when it comes to the urban crisis. It's very complicated, complex, multifaceted, as you can see. I want you to understand that all of these newcomers were subject to scorn, derision, and to some extent, segregation. 
and I do include Southern whites in that context. Uh, in 1955, there was a widely read magazine called Harper's Magazine uh, that ran a story called The Hillbillies Invade Chicago. Hillbilly was a term used to describe working class Southern whites and it was not exactly a compliment if you understand what I mean. Uh, the story depicted working class Southern whites as people that were generally undesirable. They sat on their porch all day, chewing tobacco, uh, fixing their car over and over and over again. It even insinuated that they would probably depreciate your property value. And so it was not uncommon for Southern whites to not only be the subject of derision, but also have them excluded from certain neighborhoods and certain other social institutions. My question for you is if it's that bad for people who at the end of the day are, are white, What's it like for people of color? What is the experience in the cities going to be for, for, for somebody of the uh, Latino variety? Well, as it turns out, we, we can actually answer that question in this class. Similar to Emmett Till, um, you, you, can actually, uh, you can actually gain a lot of information, a lot of understanding as to what's going on and the uh, immigrant slash racial minority experience of this post-war period by examining the life and times of Felix Longoria. Now, for your notes, Longoria is a veteran of World War II. He was sent to fight in the Pacific, and he never comes home. He's a casualty. Okay. Uh, at the time of his death, he was buried in a temporary uh, uh, grave in the Pacific, and in uh, the post-war period, his, his remains will come home, and they will come home to South Texas. He used to be a citizen of um, uh, Three Rivers, Texas. Uh, the closest landmark I can give you is probably going to be Corpus Christi, so southern Texas. And Three Rivers was a tiny little town. And um, one of the things that his wife, or his widow now, Beatrice Longoria, had to deal with is uh, providing funeral services for him. She wanted to provide his wake, or have his wake, at the only funeral parlor in all, in all of Three Rivers. It was ran by a guy who was not a native Texan. He was actually from Pennsylvania. Uh, but what this guy is going to do is he's going to refuse to allow Beatrice Longoria to, to use his funeral parlor. And when she presses him on the issue and asks why, very natural question as far as she was concerned, he responds with the whites would not like it. In other words, this is going to be bad for my business. As a non-native Texan, I can see the way that things work down here. Um, I can see that there's a world for whites and there's a world for everyone else. And in a lot of instances, not that much different than how things worked in Mississippi. To that extent, not that much different than the way that things worked in South Chicago, that, that there's two separate worlds and, and, and you don't see a lot of blurring of that line. That it would ruin his business because the white community would just simply not accept what we would probably refer to as integration. So Beatrice accepts this, at least temporarily, but she does call a, uh, a, a leader within a budding civil rights movement, a physician during World War II, a guy by the name of Dr. Hector Garcia. Now, in addition to being a, a physician, he is also the, the founder and a leading official in a civil rights organization known as the American GI Forum. For your notes, the whole purpose of the American GI Forum was to inform uh, uh, Mexican-American veterans of the benefits that they were entitled to. Uh, college education, cheap home loans, health care, all of these things. To educate them, to bring them up to speed, that they were entitled to these things. These were not perks, they were not privileges, they were rights according to the GI Bill of Rights. Um, but it's also, as you might imagine, an outlet that is going to enforce what we probably best call equality in American life. So it's Garcia that actually called this funeral parlor director and, and said, I don't know if you know this, but the guy that you just turned away from your funeral parlor is a war hero, and uh, y you might want to reconsider where you are on this. Um, the guy running the funeral parlor gives Garcia the same runaround that he had given Longoria, and so Garcia can see he's getting nowhere fast, and the next call that he makes is going to be to Washington, D.C. The junior senator from the Austin area, a guy by the name of Lyndon Baines Johnson. 
I want to tell you just a little bit about Lyndon Johnson because I think that this is going to help shed some light on uh, the times, uh, meaning this particular era, but also Johnson's political career because, as I'm sure you're aware, one day in the not-so-distant future, Johnson's going to be president. Okay. Johnson was a politician if there ever was one. He was a very talented politician. He knew how to politic, as you're going to find out. A uh, masterful uh, uh, player of the game, if you will. But like anything else, uh, there, there's an ugly side to this, this game that he's playing. Let me say that it is not for no good reason that Johnson's uh, nickname, humorous nickname, it was an inside joke, was Landslide Linden. Johnson won his seat in the Senate in 1948 on the most controversial uh, of methods. He was taking on a guy that in the world of Texas politics was, was an absolute legend, Coke Stevenson, uh, the, the, the former governor of the state of Texas, was wildly, wildly popular, and it was seen as a slam dunk uh, in 1948 to win that Senate seat. Johnson, for all intents and purposes, stole it from him. Um, you might say allegedly stole it from him, but there, there's a lot of evidence that drives directly at that. This was not supposed to be much of a contest, but it was a very, very close election, and it all came down to Duval County, Texas, which had a history of, shall we say, some interesting politics when it comes to uh, votes going for or against a specific candidate. Um, essentially, it's going to be a few, uh, a, a few dozen votes that would separate uh, the 1948 uh, senatorial victory from Lyndon Johnson from Stevenson. And uh, to this day, there's, there's historians that still call into question the actual legitimacy of Johnson's victory. But Johnson wins, and although you, you certainly would have to say that he's rough around the edges, he's not exactly as smooth as a Franklin Roosevelt or later on a John F. Kennedy, um, you, you might also say that uh, at the end of the day, he had a pretty good heart that uh, he had this history of rooting for the underdog and people that couldn't always, uh, you know, protect themselves. So when Garcia called Lyndon Johnson uh, and explained the situation to him, the first words out of LBJ's mouth was, we'll bury him in Arlington. And by Arlington, I don't mean Texas. I mean Arlington Cemetery in Washington, D.C. There's a lot of really, really important people that are buried in that part of the country. And it's a great, great honor. And Johnson was going to use the powers that he had at his disposal to kind of right this wrong or this lack of civil rights as he saw it, burying him in Arlington Cemetery. Now, initially, Johnson's real gung-ho on this, but over the course of time, uh, the people uh, in, in the state of Texas, some of those same people that very much supported the funeral parlor's decision not to allow the Longorias to wake Felix in their funeral parlor, um, some of the people that were very instrumental, movers and shakers that helped LBJ get elected to the Senate, they really start to come after him and really begin to ask him, uh, do you want the federal government spotlighting our state in this particular uh, way? And Johnson really tries to back away from this decision to, to, to bury him in Arlington. He begins to put distance between himself and what comes to be known as the Longoria Affair. But from the Mexican American uh, Mexican American perspective, the Longoria affair and, and Johnson's role within it is going to win him a lot of support and a lot of acclaim in, in, in the communities in Texas that might be described as people of color. Certainly that's going to be the case in, 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 in the Mexican American and maybe even better broadly defined Latino communities. That would, uh, that, that, that would have this uh, chant, Viva Johnson. And when Johnson will be tapped as the running mate of John F. Kennedy in 1960, it's going to be this Latino community in Texas that's going to provide uh, the, the last little push that'll push John Kennedy over the top in states like California, states like Texas, that will, that will ultimately be very determinative for the 1960 election. And so although he doesn't try to really capitalize this on the time and, and, and really move his political career forward, it turns out to be a blessing uh, to LBJ, this decision that he's going to make. 
Okay. And that kind of drives at the essence of this brand of civil rights activism in the post-war period. We've talked about the LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. And we know that this reform that they were, you know, sponsoring, and certainly the American GI Forum would also fall into this category, it was not radical. These are institutions that basically want accommodation. They want to be accepted by the bigger, broader, mainstream American society. They're not asking to reinvent the wheel. It's not going to be like that civil rights activism in the 1960s with people like Dolores Yortes or Cesar Chavez. Um, it's not going to be like the black power movement that you're going to see emerge, at least initially, under uh, Malcolm X and kind of crest with uh, Bobby Seale and the Black Panthers. This is not radical reform. What they basically want is integration, and they're putting all of their eggs to that end, all of their eggs into the basket of these liberal, generally white politicians like Lyndon Johnson. It's going to be this faith in the post-war liberal democratic system that these people are going to be placing their hopes, their dreams, and their expectations as far as the future. And although you can point to progress, if you're following along in the PowerPoint with me, you're looking at a couple of Supreme Court case decisions that are ultimately going to be instrumental in the, uh, in the integration of the schools from the Latin American variety. Um, at the same time, it's going to be painfully, painfully slow. And that would be the case for the black community as well. Certainly the 1964 Civil Rights Act, it was meaningful and progressive in that way. The Voting Rights Act uh, was a game changer in a good way. But in a lot of ways, especially as the 1960s continue to unfold, it's going to be seen as too little too late. And you're going to see the radicalization of the civil rights movement. And certainly you would see that in, in the Latino community as well. You'll see the the the, uh, the the crusade for justice. You'll see Chavez and uh, the farm workers that are pushing for a far more radical uh, vision as far as what they consider to be civil rights. And you'll see the establishment of the Brown Berets, uh, the 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 Latino uh, counterpart to uh, to the Black Panthers. Right. In any case, you'll see what I mean once we uh, once we begin to examine the 1960s. For right now, guys, that's where I want to leave it. I'll see you later.